Okay, apart from the study of complex variables, which will be uh, the chapter 10 of this unit one, uh, th this is the uh, uh, last gasp of the review uh, unit number one. And um, it's the one where I try to put together some of the ideas of quantum mechanics and the connection to the contact transformations that uh, we've introduced. Uh, this time I've given you a problem set that is uh, worth uh, at least two or three times as much as the ones you've had so far. So this, this, this is an important one. It's also a fun one. And um, I will entertain questions on the internet if you have them. Uh, it's not uh, a strict um, take home exam, but you should treat it as such. You should work it uh, yourself. Um, to be uh, kosher, as it were. So it's going to uh, just uh, connect with a couple of things that are in this uh, thing and something that and some things we've uh, talked about already. But um, I'll mention a few things uh, in this. And with regard to uh, the two kinds of pendulum. The ordinary pendulum I'll do first here just to finish up what we started in the last lecture. But the um, cycloidal or um, set, set of a pendulum, a cycloidal, that's the thing that's sitting in the corner of the room up on the wall there. Uh, we have it all simulated, so I won't have to uh, actually work that thing, but you're welcome to try to play with it later on. It has some uh, neat things that. Uh, are easy to show. So far I haven't written a paper about this, but it, it really is something that we uh, should get out there. This guy uh, is a really smart guy, a guy that gave Huygens principles, but he also invented uh, Newton's calculus before uh, Newton did it. Uh, and he was just a young guy, Newton was pretty old by the time he started doing that. Um, we're going to see uh, what he did with respect to the most important thing physics has done in many sense is get good oscillators, oscillators that are good clocks. And it's almost as though the quality factor, which we'll talk about in unit four, of our oscillators is directly proportional to the quality of the civilization that uses them. And this is a, a kind of a message of, about quantum and classical mechanics that is worth keeping in mind. The use of resonance and uh, something that really tracks time well is so important. Well, um, let's go ahead here and I'll talk about that stuff. But then I want to make about halfway through this lecture, beginning of our connection uh, to um, quantum mechanics and actually relativity too, but it's kind of hiding in the background in all of the stuff that we'll be talking about here. The um, things that we have uh, talked about so far, uh, and uh, the thing that you just did a homework problem uh, on, uh, involves the envelopes and uh, contact uh, transformations with the envelope. And also, what's often left out of, uh, of, of discussions of such things um, is the uh, so-called blast wave. Well, we've got one of those on the sophomore physics uh, Earth uh, deal. This would be the um, possible uh, drawing for a blast that was low velocity on the uh, surface of the Earth. We will later discuss what it really looks like if it's a Coulomb field. Uh, but I'd like to show you the oscillator one uh, fairly shortly here. But in any case, this uh, object here and its heights, and some of you have just, uh, uh, this morning I saw discovered some interesting things about the kites inside the focal plane. Uh, very often they can be made into an American kite as well. In any case, um, this is what I'd like to just show you really quickly here is an explosion of uh, a neutron star starlet. Uh, imagine it hits a patch of uranium so that uh, the neutrons all start 
going crazy, and they fly out again at um, a particular velocity, or near that particular velocity, and so we'll uh, see uh, the result of that on a simulation that, uh, I'll just do it right here, um, the exploding starlet, and this is, this is uh, you know, quite pretty. Now it has some technicolor in it, and I'm going to explain that. The idea is that when you have a swarm of particles that makes a pattern like that, uh, it's possible to imagine the actual quantum wave function on top of that. And uh, we characterize that wave function by color, the color representing the phase. That's what we're going to talk about at the very end of, the, of uh, today's lecture. But um, that is a, um, an important uh, part of in any of these uh, discussions here. Uh, wherever I drop this thing, uh, inside a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator that automatically stops when it recollapses on the other focus. And that, that's, uh, that's kind of neat. The, the focus uh, played a role in the homework problem you just did. This is a slightly more complicated version of that that occurs uh, now, not a uniform gravitational field, but in the uh, uh, ideal sophomore physics Earth, two-dimensional harmonic oscillator, isotropic harmonic oscillator. It also uh, uh, occurs in more complicated situations we'll talk about later on. But you see all of the features there. In fact, there isn't that much difference from this. If you stand back, this is no longer a parabola. It's an ellipse. And all of curves in there are not parabolas, at least. Uh, uh, maybe some are approximately parabolic for a while. but. Um, the, everything in there. So it's an envelope, an elliptical envelope of ellipses, and the homework problem that you did was a uh, parabolic envelope of parabolas. And so there are at least three conic sections. Now we haven't done hyperbolas. That will come later uh, when we talk about the more complicated stuff. Okay, um, let's uh, go back here, and there's the uh, control panel. Uh, for this, uh, if you want to uh, play with it, you can set the number of particles to uh, one or two or three or something that's a little less dense and see what things are actually doing. One of the things that I should point out there is if you take the compass and put it right here at the top and draw an arc, it goes through these convergence points. Those are the focus of the envelope to the double focus. Now, uh, the th homework problem that I've given this so they'll take home exam. Uh, the first one uh, has to do with um, a, kind, a different kind of, um, of explosion. Uh, what we're uh, interested in um, in this uh, first problem that's on your um, that's on, on on the assignment there is imagining that we have an asteroid that's uh, uniform density, you know, same old sophomore physics uh, configuration. But we drill tunnels from a certain point on the asteroid to other, uh, say, cities in, on the asteroid surface. And um, the idea is to see what would happen uh, if you had, um, well, it's drawn in the, uh, of a figure of one there, or uh, more like in figure two, we have uh, a whole bunch of cars that leave at once. And at every instant, uh, there's some curve describing, I call it an oval, in uh, a figure two there. But um, I'll just tell you right now, that should be a circle. You should prove that before uh, doing uh, much else with this problem. OK, uh, we'll get back to that a little bit uh, uh, shortly here. But what I'd like to do uh, right now, uh, just to get it out of the way, um, I would like uh, to uh, take a look at the um, plain old uh, pendulum that we talked about just at the end of the last class uh, on Monday. The um, three different geometries that are present here uh, depend on what you're interested in, and I want we didn't get to this one, so we need to do that. But I want to make sure that 
this business with plus and minus sign blunders doesn't ever uh, bother uh, anybody here. Uh, the basic idea uh, of this, um, <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and get the other uh, guys here up to speed because I'm particularly interested in making sure we understand what's going on um, when you think about the Hamiltonian as a function of the things it's function, it is supposed to be a function of, and that is a coordinate, in this case one angle here, and a momentum, uh, another angle, <coughs> I should say another axis uh, right here. So uh, remember that uh, a cosine starts out at the origin with a nice, uh, well it starts out as a parabola, uh, and then becomes a negative parabola later on. We're interested in that negative parabola. That we're interested in being on the, on the downside of the uh, cosine, not on the upside, which is uh, what we call saddle point. And that's what we're going to play with. We're going to look at uh, uh, how these orbits move and what their timing is and all of that. And that's um, a very important thing that was a problem, a terrible problem for physics when uh, first we had clocks with pendulums and physicists were trying to use it to, well, do uh, experiments with astronomy but also do uh, things in a, uh, some, in a terrestrial laboratory. And the, the, this, this pendulum is, is just terrible for keeping time. It's a real uh, pain in the batonski. So uh, something had to be done and this is what uh, Huygens managed to do. So we're going to be talking about his pendulum and how it uh, solved a really difficult problem, a thing that made physics look like it really wasn't a, an exact science. So uh, that is, I think, the message, uh, like a political message I want to get out today. But um, first, I would like to make sure that, that, that you see that we want a potential that is the minus cosine. And then you remember uh, that the partial derivative of this thing with respect to um, with respect to uh, uh, the coordinate uh, it is going to be a, a force, but it, the partial derivative has to have a minus sign on it in order to, to be correct. And so we are using the minus cosine here, and the Lagrangian is the difference uh, of the kinetic and potential, whereas the Hamiltonian is the sum. So you've got a minus sign sitting right there uh, in front of the cosine the way it should be. And the idea, of course, is you can remember that the Hamiltonian thing that gives the momentum change, the uh, equation with a minus sign. Why is that? How do you uh, rationalize that minus sign on partial derivative of h with respect to coordinate q? Okay, uh, that that gives you a minus p dot. In other words, minus the force, okay? Well, the force is therefore the minus of the partial derivative as it should be for mathematician. I mean, for physicist, not a mathematician. So that minus sign is that nasty little minus that the physicist always has to put in there to get a, uh, a, a, for, a driving force as opposed to a force that holds it back, which would be the negative of that, okay? So once again, I want to make that that is absolutely clear and understood. So if we're going to go at it from the Hamiltonian point of view, we'll have a minus here. If we go from the Lagrangian point of view, uh, there are no minus signs in the first and second equation, so you got a plus sign uh, sitting right where it should be. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything else. Well, this I would point out right away. This is a funny way, uh, all of this, and put all three screens because this is, I think, really important. This is called the symplectic structure of Hamiltonian mechanics, where you have this minus sign there. And the reason that's uh, important is because uh, for just these two variables, uh, the coordinate, in this case theta, and the momentum, in this case p theta, this uh, axis right here, this is a two-dimensional problem completely displayed. All the things that can happen to it are right here in the open. And the idea is that this uh, arrangement here, partial with respect to momentum, and then minus the partial with respect to the coordinate, 
uh, can be written as minus the gradient of the Hamiltonian crossed with a unit vector in this direction, the unit vector that describes the Hamiltonian axis. So H axis cross fall line, the fall line would be that gradient, okay, of the uh, of this, that's this gradient here of the Hamiltonian with a minus sign, okay, and that gives you uh, either motion this way, that's the left-handed motion you expect from a phase space, or if the minus wasn't there, it would be a mathematician going the other way in the right, uh, he would say, in the correct direction, but uh, we know better than that. And so that is the basic idea. This h-axis here is the uh, uh, unit vector of the coordinate cross the unit vector associated with the momentum in this um, this is a one-dimensional di system. One degree of freedom is the correct uh, expression for what we're dealing with here. Now what I want you to do is take the Lagrangian for the uh, uh, pendulum uh, uh, to uh, use that, the, actually the Lagrangian just for um, a, a, a one-dimensional oscillator really uh, when, we, when we do the, the, the homework problem. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything else here that I should be uh, talking about. I think that's about all I need to do. Anyway, here is a carefully drawn face portrait by the programs that you can play with uh, on, the, uh, on this thing. And that's what I'd like to go ahead and do uh, fairly shortly here. But first, I've got to say a, a few words about some funny functions. This is sort of taking us out of the review. Uh, area and into uh, something a little bit more complicated, but we do uh, have a um, an integration of this. The Hamiltonian comes uh, right here at this point uh, to have an advantage, and that is that the Hamiltonian uh, here, if in fact is no explicit time dependence, uh, means that it's completely constant. A constant of motion is what you all often hear. Of, of people say. And um, that constant, um, very obviously the energy, the total energy of this thing, uh, <clears throat> this uh, is, is a very uh, thing. Now if you have uh, kinetic energy equal to zero or heat equal to zero, that's uh, uh, what you would uh, <clears throat> normally uh, just have as a start off this whole thing, but the total energy uh, being a constant is really uh, an important uh, thing to have because then I can really write an integral uh, that involves the thing that's being held constant and uh, I can keep in, in some cases uh, th this turn this thing into a quadrature. This is the uh, quarter period is what we're doing here. We're going out to a, a certain amplitude that we've set this thing to and we're saying hey, what's the travel time? Uh, there. And it's, it's kind of a pretty little thing, but that's not an easy integral to do by any means. In fact, uh, whole careers of mathematicians have come to give us uh, a way to do uh, that integral, and that's known as an elliptic integral, and elliptic functions result from that integral. So uh, this involves a whole lot of mathematics, starting with the 600 BC mathematics of good old Mr. Thales in Turkey. Uh, the um, <coughs> amazing inventor of geometry in 600 BCE. There's the Thales rectangle, which we're going to see so many times, and you probably noticed it in your homework problem as well. So, um, let's go ahead and just finish this, just so you can see it uh, real time, so to speak. Uh, the integral that results from using the half angle, this guy right here, that's the, um, the time if you're going to do the timing of this uh, problem, uh, that sort of geometry is an easy way uh, to get uh, the geometry needed to solve this integral. So this is a, the way you usually see the formula here, 1 minus k squared sine squared of epsilon. And the result of that, and I'll go ahead and put it all up here, the result of doing that integral is to produce a weird kind of function, the uh, inverse elliptic function a m minus one inverse a m u function. Amu, I don't know, some people just call amu. 
Uh, but basically, that's what the sign, if this had been a harmonic oscillator, we would have just be done here because I would be integrating this, uh, <clears throat> this thing right here, which is an elementary uh, arc sine integral. And uh, it would get, immediately give me uh, a, a time uh, versus uh, the integral that's the, what you would get. And then you can turn that around and, and, just, and get what we always know about our ordinary harmonic oscillator. Instead, uh, with, the, um, <coughs> with the pendulum, it's not a harmonic uh, oscillator. Uh, it's a nasty harmonic oscillator, and it doesn't keep time. And that's what I want to show you very graphically with the, with the, um, <coughs> the simulations that we have here. In any case, this is another way to write that particular uh, in, uh, elliptic integral of the first kind. Uh, that's a fancy way to write it that mathematicians know about, but most physicists have worked with uh, this at one point or another. And what happens, of course, is that this becomes, the AMU inverse becomes the inverse sign uh, in the limit that the uh, epsilon angle here, that we don't move the pendulum but a few pixels, well, then we can have a sine curve. So that's what I'm going to show you very shortly here uh, in the simulations. Okay, let's see if there's anything else I need to say here. As I say, uh, this does reduce uh, to what we <coughs> uh, know and love as the simplest differential equation for oscillations. So well, the simulation I'm going to show you uh, that will um, be the uh, be the dynamics that is represented by that uh, three-dimensional picture uh, at the end there of the Hamiltonian uh, will have uh, the Hamiltonian space, that is the phase space, angle and momentum here, and then it'll have an um, actual pendulum uh, here, and we're going to take pendulum right up where it's, it, it gets really crazy. That means in this neighborhood uh, of the saddle points, the points that you see on the right and left side uh, over there, uh, either have uh, uh, sticking straight up having come uh, uh, to positive pi or sticking straight up having come to minus pi. E either one of those uh, saddle points is uh, a point where uh, if you put it there, uh, it's going to leave exponentially from that point the slightest noise or disturbance. This is an, an, an old problem. Is how, how, how long could I keep a pendulum completely upright with perfect bearings and I figure out some way to really precisely get it there, but then uh, just a few molecules moving in the room or uh, just anything. Uh, and then finally, if you really were being precise uh, and you fall into the wave function associated with and try to keep that, that's going to spread in the classical motion and take over. So it's really hard to balance something on a saddle point. And uh, we'll kind of see that uh, when we play with these uh, simulations. That's a, an important, uh, I think, lesson uh, of this. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start this uh, right here and also show uh, what a terrible oscillator of the pendulum is. So uh, I think this is it. And then we're going to come and get Huygens' uh, pendulum out, that thing that's on the wall over there, and look at it and see what an improvement it is. So I already. I'm really high, but I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, have this thing uh, start uh, in the center here, uh, where it's more well behaved and more harmonic. So uh, forget that thing for a while. Let's uh, go right here and see what we get. And you can see the oscillation is a heck of a lot higher frequency than that thing that we were just doing there. And uh, this next one right here, go to 0.5, okay, and you can see um, it, it kind of looks harmonic for about four wiggles, but I think you'll notice at the end here, it's not meeting, it's not coming back the same as the low amplitude guy. So if I make the amplitude lower, probably I get an oscillation that uh, really seems to have the same frequency as the one that I 
uh, just showed there. And if I go lower still, it's kind of hard to do with uh, this thing sitting here because I have to get it right on a zero there. But I start with that. That's not much different. But still, uh, at least for the four or five oscillations you can see on the screen there, it's looking harmonic. But already, I can see that this thing is failing me. And if I go out here to uh, one, uh, unit, unit one radian uh, starting place, I'm out after the first half of a, of a, of a cycle. This is horrible. Okay, so a pendulum uh, swinging with an amplitude which is easily red uh, is, is really no good at all and one that's sort of uh, halfway in between there is a little better but they're, they're just getting more and more terrible as we go up in amplitude here. So uh, that for example is, is gone. Now we're really talking elliptic function. I need to know the elliptic function uh, from about uh, an amplitude of 0.5 uh, to, um, you know, wherever, all right? So as I go out here to 2, I mean, it, 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 you know, it's way off, way, way, way off, okay? And so it's this, this is a, this was a terrible thing to have happen to physics. It's a good thing to happen to physics because they had to get it right. Or we could have just said, well, physics is not an exact science. Well, this, this is a terrible pen. Terrible timekeepers. Now, what I'm doing here is actually taking a Fourier transform. We'll talk later on about that. That's a good way of doing mechanics in some situations. You'll see here that I have a little pulse, and then I have a sort of a derivative of that. And then I get another one right here. Basically, what I get is one. I don't get it at two, but I get it at three, and I get it at five. Of multiples of the frequency. That's uh, something that uh, we'll talk about later on, the Fourier series and all of that when we talk about resonance. Okay, so I think this is as much as you want to see of this thing, but you should be aware that we don't have to confine ourselves uh, to this uh, region in here. We can go outside of that uh, very nicely, but uh, before I go outside of it, let's try to go uh, to the saddle point, okay? So uh, that's three. Uh, I don't want to go to, to pi quite there because I'll be out of, out of the uh, region, but I think I can get a pretty good uh, thing there. That's, well, that was too far. Uh, I've got to uh, go there maybe. Now you're starting to see an elliptic function look more like a square wave. And these elliptic functions are really important because if you have a Bose-Einstein con condensate, the wave function of that thing uh, is basically a square wave. That's, that, that's the other thing these particular elliptic functions are good for. This has only been noticed fairly recently. So th that's a really uh, neat thing. I'll go for uh, one more try here. I'm going to try to let this thing go by clicking up here and see if I can get it to go. Uh, there we go. Now that's a very, very, very square way. That's about as square as I can get with the simulation. You can try and get within a pixel of this thing, but you've got to realize that if you do that, if you do anything uh, that's outside of here, it's gone. Okay? If I, if I do it uh, over here, it's gone that way. If I do it over here, it comes this way. And the further I go, the more I get a curve that simply has this thing whirling around forever. And, and the same thing happens as I uh, play the game up here. So all of these curves that are going up the mountainside, okay, are part of the phase space, all right? And that's where it, it just turns into a pinwheel. Okay, so there, there's a nice simulation if you want to get used to this. And you'll see the Fourier transform does some pretty interesting things that we'll talk about later on. Okay, I'm going to pause this thing. And I'm going to uh, go back and make sure that we uh, <coughs> know where we're headed here. Because I'm going to do uh, phase spaces 
very different from this. Um, that's, uh, there's a picture of what we've done. Uh, so here is a picture of the thing that's over there. I built this thing uh, quite some time ago, and it still works. It's just two weights uh, hanging here. Uh, one of them wraps around this cycloid here. This cycloid uh, curve it is the involute. Anybody know what an involute is? The locus of the center of curvature of a curve? Anybody uh, run across that? It used to be you had to learn this stuff in calculus, but you don't anymore. You should know it, though. Um, and the evolute, this curve right here, of the cycloid, okay, evolute uh, basically is what you get by wrapping a string with this curve and let it go. Okay, so it's a funny kind of compass, a compass that Huygens discovered. Okay, uh, if you look over there or look carefully here, you'll see uh, that there is a circle that's red that sticks really close to the cyclic but only breaks off from it uh, out here in the nether regions where this, you know, string is really white. We'll, we'll see that uh, a little bit in a minute here. But um, the idea is that uh, this uh, valley here, this potential, this cycloidy potential, is to the eye pretty close to a circle until you get to about here, and then it, it sort of deviates uh, from it, but not, not all that much until you get right uh, in this neighborhood. And the thing about the cycloid is that its minimum radius, I should say it's, uh, <clears throat> yes, I, I mean minimum radius of curvature, uh, and, and that's this radius right here that it shares with the circle, okay, so one of these uh, length is connected up here and does not wrap around the this, this string. So that's the ordinary pendulum uh, right there. And then this is the pendulum that, uh, that Mr. Uh, Huygens uh, eventually discovered. Now it's kind of interesting. He puzzled over this and had crummy solutions that worked pretty well in the laboratory, but he didn't until the last year of his life work out what I'm going to be showing you here and what you're going to be doing uh, with your um, problem one on the um, uh, homework today. So then that is building this construction right here on a piece of graph paper. That's why I gave you graph paper uh, that will do this. And the explanations of this are in this lecture and we'll be doing them uh, shortly here. But um, before we do that, uh, I would like to show you the animation of this weird Huygens face face. Okay? So, uh, let's go ahead and get that going here. This is a cycloidium instead of a pendulum, but uh, that's the name of this coin. A cycloidally constrained pendulum is what we're talking about here. So, there it is. Okay? And it's right out to the limit there. I'm going to take it to the middle, just like I did the other pendulum, and uh, what do you see there? Well, at that point, uh, you can um, just get a pretty much the same curve that you would get if I didn't uh, have a cycloid here instead of a circle. Pretty close to a circle, but it's not. At the ends, it, uh, it deviates. Now, one of the things about the cy cycloid uh, is as you go uh, out to the ends, it gets more curved. It doesn't look that way. And it look, it, the, the cycloid looks like it just goes straight up. But if you took a microscope to this thing, you would discover that the curvature is approaching infinity at the end of the cycloid. It doesn't look like it's doing that, but it is. It is, it's a bizarre curve. There's just no, no, no doubts about it. Now, the other thing that makes that happen uh, is, is you know, what, what's going on there is I, I will, I'm going to uh, start this again, uh, pause it, and start it again 
But this time I want you to see what it is I'm going to be asking you to construct. Is, uh, I want you to, to show the cycloid Huygens circles. Okay? And I'm assuming he knew, knew uh, all about that by the, t uh, the year that he uh, lived, uh, his final uh, year. So uh, let's go ahead and start this guy up again. Uh, sorry. Um, pause guy. Uh, I got hung. I'm sorry. Try to yeah. show main control switch. Oh, okay. This is... There we go. Okay. And the idea is this cycloid right here and here is being made by a point that's rolling. This, uh, this guy right here is being made by this circle rolling on that line. The, the points that you'll see over here are being made by this, this string, uh, you know, do, doing its thing by uh, getting um, wrapped around uh, this cycloid. And the fact that uh, the evolute of a cycloid is also the same curve as the involute of this, that is this right here being the locus of some curvature of this is, uh, it, 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 how could I say it, um, the, well, this thing evolves from that, so it's called the evolute. Uh, this is the involute of this one, and the two are that of each other. And th that's an amazing uh, property of the cycloid right there. But in any case, as we go out, trying different amplitudes, this time we discover that every amplitude we pick within the phase space here uh, is, is tracking as far as frequency goes what came before it. So I can go clear out here to 1.5 and get a pretty curve that goes through all of the uh, period points. Okay, and even an amplitude of two is showing no sign of deviating as far as its zeros go, giving you a, a record of period. And also its maxima are fitting very nicely, and it, it works that way as we approach a pi, as we uh, take the thing uh, sort of to the limit here. But at this point, we're starting to make a sawtooth. But the sawtooth is is uh, honoring uh, the thing, and it doesn't matter if you go the negative way, uh, it, uh, rather positive amplitude uh, is what you show after a half period, okay? All of that is just following uh, the same path and doing it at the same rate, time rate. And th this is, is really quite bizarre as we approach the end of the phase space for the Huygens of cyclodium or pendulum, or whatever you want to call it. And um, I can go right here to three. And basically what's happening is I've got uniform velocity until the very end, and then bang! This is a bizarre space, uh, phase space, to say the very least. And as I work my way out to try to start it at uh, near pi, it becomes more extreme. Bang! Bang! Isn't that wild? But still maintaining that period. They're all the same. Isn't that cool? Wow! And now, uh, since it's a triangular wave, you're getting the Fourier transform of a sawtooth. And actually, that's the Fourier transform. It's inverse uh, harmonic number uh, squared. And then this one is just showing it uh, a little better because it's, it's reduced uh, that uh, exponent. It goes in the Fourier series. OK? All right. Um, so that, that, to me, that is really uh, something uh, to take to the bank, as it were. Physics uh, survived. Now, physics uh, astronomers could time things uh, uh, better. They didn't have to use the clocks up in the air, up in the sky, uh, quite as much uh, uh, to begin 
uh, seeing a phenomena of orbits of various uh, planets, stars, and whatever. Okay, but in the process we have this, these two circles. So I want to say something about that because that's what you're going to be uh, constructing. And this is all just to do with uh, the uh, very first problem, which uh, in many ways is the most important one uh, on this particular uh, thing. Now, um, this is the graph paper I gave you. Uh, what you're going to have to do, of course, is make sure, you see, th this construction is not a, a kosher one. That is, it involves pi, pi and irrational numbers. So this is outside of the Euclidean uh, geometry. We have to set things up using graph paper, and then we can all play with our ruler and compass. And the idea, is, of course, is the radius is plotted as an irrational here, so that the angles can be rational. And here we go with uh, units of 15 degrees. Uh, I'll draw the have you draw just at 30 degree intervals uh, the two cycloids that you see here. So the circle. Uh, and the angle of that circle is going to be your one independent variable, uh, call it phi, this one's labeled as theta, but it's called phi in the problem. And that um, is marked off very nicely here. All I've done is, is use the um, idea of the, taking the radius of a circle and striking an arc, okay, uh, and then breaking that up uh, into multiples of uh, the uh, angle. So there's 15 degree intervals here that we're going to use. They, they come across 30 degree intervals coming across here that will be points on a cycloid. And we're just going to use the definition of a cycloid, which is a uh, circle rolling uh, 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 on the uh, ceiling. You can see the circle rolling on the ceiling there. And then there's another circle down here. Uh, one of them starts here and the other one starts here in the construction, but there they're together. And that's exactly where the string goes through, you see, uh, on the Huygens uh, wraparound. So um, basically it comes down to uh, letting your uh, ruler and compass go to work here and finding where the points are that you need to uh, draw, you, know, you draw a circle and an interval that is rationally described by these integers and fractions thereof. And I'm only going to here draw uh, six of them, but I'll be drawing six of them this way. So one will be rolling on the ceiling, and uh, I don't know if the next thing shows here. Uh, a few more. There we go. Anyway, th this is just this one rolling. Uh, pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 2, da, 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 and this one doing the same thing the other way. And then, uh, if you've done it all right, you'll actually see the strings connect here as they wrap off of the top cycloid to give the lower one. So this is a very clear demonstration of the evolute being obtained from the involute, but then this thing could be used by simply projecting, if you could do that, uh, up to here, uh, the actual radius of curvature at this point. But this is where it shows very clearly th that the radius is going down. And by the time I get to this particular circle, I'm all that close to being at the end here, you see. And I have just a few pixels to go. But I've got to go to an in, I've got to go to infinite curvature. That's zero radius, uh, just going from here to there. Okay, is that is that clear? Does that make uh, sense? This is this is what you've got to do. Okay. All right. Now um, let's see if there's anything else. I think I'm going to. Uh, skip this particular one. The catcher and I, we just looked at that very briefly um, um, uh, on the um, f preceding lecture. But um, I'm going to go ahead and pause and get out of here because we have some other things to do uh, uh, now. <clears throat> so uh, there's the picture of the geometry 
of, of Huygens. And this is the catcher in the eye, which we'll skip now. Okay, so the rest of this is going to be try to make some sense out of the Hamiltonian and, 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 and uh, Lagrangian. But in particular, build out of this uh, something really Jacobi uh, was the uh, originator, but Hamilton, smart guy, probably did it uh, over a weekend. Uh, th this is where they almost discovered quantum mechanics, but didn't quite. And before I do that, I want to talk about an optimization that's really uh, a key to uh, this. And this whole homework is, is based on uh, finding optimum time, getting the time down on taxis that go through tunnels uh, in the earth. Uh, that, that's the whole uh, thing. And we're doing about half of that job. We'll be doing the rest of it involving hypocycloids and epicycloids, but that's much later. I decided to draw the line right here for now. So what I want to do is show you a very weird derivation of Lagrange's equations. We've, we've been through a number of them already, uh, particularly the last one was the algebraic one you find in every uh, other mechanics textbook. But uh, here I'm, I'm playing with something that's called the calculus of variations. And this strange derivation of Lagrange's equations is, is, is going to come out of this. Now, this, how many people have uh, uh, read any of the Feynman lectures? Just out of curiosity, yeah. put your hand up. One, uh, Feynman lectures? A while ago. A while ago, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, one of the things you might have remembered in there was he talks about a, a pervadive lecture. It's a pervadive lecture showing a picture of him actually sitting at the, at the uh, podium in a... Um, a class in 1964, which, uh, I happened to be there when that was, but he never told me that he was doing these lectures. I missed them. He figured I wouldn't be interested or something. I don't know. But in, in any case, uh, he talks about how he uh, was interested in uh, something his high school teacher, Mr. Bedar, uh, uh, told him, and that was that uh, really mechanics comes down uh, to optimizing uh, an integral of the Lagrangian. He just thought that was really cool, and, and uh, he makes a big point of it in, in, in the uh, lecture and in the book. Okay? Now, I'm just doing the algebra here that uh, everyone uh, knows about, but what the idea of calculus of variations is that you, you don't just vary one variable, you vary an entire curve. So every point on this curve uh, is up for grabs, to be taken up or down some amount, or be left alone. Uh, but basically what we do is we imagine a very small variation that was, say, continuous, so you can actually differentiate that delta QT, and then it was quite small, much smaller than, say, a few pixels uh, uh, of the thing. And you ask yourself, uh, is there anything, an arbitrarily small variation function is allowed at every point, uh, except at the end points. You, you nail the thing here. But you allow everyone else uh, to move uh, s some arbitrary function. It might be that you just do move one point, uh, assuming this is a digital uh, arrangement of some kind. Okay. So apart from this thing, uh, what I'm going to do here is figure out how the interval of this thing varies if I screw around with the del q's and the del q dot. That means that you would actually be changing the velocity of, of these little deltas as well, possibly. Okay, so th th this thing is a function of q and q dot and t uh, in general. Okay, uh, I'm uh, asking here, what is the variation of this? This is uh, what you might call a del s uh, due to some uh, choice. And you, have, you can choose all of these pixels here to change. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a, a definition of just time derivative. Okay, so uh, that is the whole idea of this. And what you're doing here, uh, after you've um, <clears throat> made the, the rules for it, uh, is going ahead and looking at uh, this particular guy right here. This is partial L respect to Q dot times a, a del. Okay, so I'm going to be re rewriting that here using the product rule once again. You remember we used that to derive Lagrange's equation in an algebraic way, but that, that's what we've got here. So we go ahead and re, recast this thing using the, the 
on the definitions here that I have. So I, I, I have this thing changed here to that, and then I have this guy uh, right here coming from this one. That one uh, showed up there, and this one uh, is a part of that integral that has just sprung up into being here. And uh, we go and do this between a limit, but it, you're talking about uh, a derivative uh, that's being integrated. So you just end up with this thing being taken to the limits, t0 and t1, t0 and t1. Okay. So that's fine. And then you're left uh, now with this part right here, an integral of the Lagrangian plus, and you've got this guy right here as your very uh, simple expression of the variation. Now, we already said that we don't want anything going on at the endpoints. So once we say that, cross this term out, we're then left with this. And the idea is, uh, after we vanish the third term, is this leaves a first order variation a formula. And guess what's inside that? Well, it, it's uh, Lagrange equations. If I demand that this thing is uh, optimized, that is, the delta is zero, the first order. That's the derivation. So the idea that the Lagrange uh, integral here is at uh, some kind of either maximum or minimum, this isn't saying yet, but it's, it's, it's a, uh, 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 the variation has gone to zero, uh, to first order. So that's, this is the thing that Feynman really was uh, just taken by uh, when he was in high school, and he continues to pass that on uh, in the classroom in 1964. But this he fails to ask. I mean, he's obviously asking himself, but he's, he's not ready to tell a class about this or something. And the question really is, why is nature so inclined to fly just so it to, and it turns out, minimize, but to extremize in some way, the Lagrangian? What is going on there? What is so special about T minus U? You say, T plus U? Okay, constant. That's Hamilton. But this is a whole different story now. We're talking about T minus U. Okay. All right. Well, we've got some work to do. And this is where we make the connection. And this is something Dirac was, at the time, beginning to work on. And it wasn't to those two guys men, uh, Feynman and Dirac, that uh, things really started to happen in this thing that we're talking about here, and that is really understanding some ideas about quantum phase. So uh, we already have uh, talked about enough times here that she's probably bored with it, the, the uh, Legendre transformation and the Poincaré invariant differential is just that with a dt cleared out. So I go through and I multiply by the, uh, uh, an increment in time, well, uh, this uh, V being dr dt uh, would imply then that uh, V dt is dr. So I'm going to go ahead and write that as dr. Okay? And then we have the Hamiltonian minus uh, dt. So the genre transformation is giving us this, pdr minus h dt. That's a big deal because this is an action that involves momentum and position. This is an action that involves energy and time. These are products of, of two, shall we say, uh, mutually uh, sympathetic quantities that we, uh, we uh, talk about all the time. Basically, here's where wave mechanics raises its either ugly or beautiful head, depending on how you feel about uh, doing quantum mechanics. This differential of action has, whose time derivative rate is L, that, that is turning out here to be uh, basically the quantum phase. Well, what is phase? A phase of a wave is the k vector dot the posi differential position and the omega frequency vector dot the time differential. Well, you already have learned that in 1900, Planck decided that maybe uh, energy was linear in frequency, so he wrote E equal h bar 
omega times an integer. He, he needed that in order to make uh, some thermodynamics work. And then this guy right here is, is the k vector. Well, what it is, it's h, the claim constant, or h bar uh, times the, uh, this, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, momentum, uh, I'm sorry, the, the wave vector, h bar k is this guy, h bar omega is that guy. So what you've done uh, by you know, looking at the Legendre transformation this way is connect with the Broglie. Now this doesn't come until 1921, okay? But they had this, okay, for quite a while before 1929, and Einstein is kind of knows this is true, but didn't write it down. And the the whole thing gives you the the phase, and it makes the, the classical mechanics of uh, Legendre transformations and things come alive. Mm -hmm. So this is really the Q thing. This is where you can make a crude wave function by simply writing e to the i this s, this action. But the trouble is, in order to get the s, you've got to integrate this sucker. And that might be a problem. But anyway, it's very, show, very showy as far as uh, coming to be a wave function. This is a three-dimensional wave function for something. Well, light is the first thing to think about, but that's not all there is, of course. Matter waves do the same uh, uh, geometry, so to speak, geometry and algebra. Now, when is this integrable? That's the question, okay? This differential here, okay? If you could write this uh, quantity here, that's uh, this, this first one, okay? If you could write that as a uh, x derivative, and then this one is a y derivative, you'd be home free. You, you could integrate this. Uh, that is, you could make a single function out of the integral. Not a multi-valued function, but a single one. Now, is that a really advanced idea? No, it isn't. This is sophomore physics right here. Similar to the conditions of integrating work, dw f dot dr, okay, to get a potential W, I'm using the same symbols over here uh, for uh, this, more or less. And uh, the condition uh, is that no curl is present in the field that we're talking about. No, uh, we want the curl of F to be zero so that I can get the partial symmetry. This, the, the partial with respect to Y of first and X second should give you the same thing as the other way around. So partial fx with respect to y has to be equal to partial fy with respect to x. If that's true, if you have that, if you have those rules, okay, that is, if this coefficient right here is the partial of this thing with respect to r, that's this differential, and this one right here, that's this coefficient right here, uh, is partial s with respect to t, Okay, and it's minus h. You got to put a minus sign here, all right? Uh, it's integrable. So that's how you derive in just basically one line of the hamilton jacobi equations. Now, if you look in a famous book like Goldstein, this takes 65 pages to derive this. This is a sixth of a page. Okay, th that's the kind of insight that you like to get. And that's the kind of insight that happened when uh, Feynman and um, Dirac met at a, just an APS meeting. And Dirac has, has written a paper. He says, look at this. He says, you, I'm showing that the Lagrangian is, is related somehow uh, to the phase. Feynman says, what are you talking about? The Lagrangian is the phase. This comes out says that. Yeah. Dirac was, you know, uh, you're kind of right. But it isn't right. He's got the units wrong. But, you know, Feynman, he can get away with that. So uh, he, he uh, convinces Dirac that we've got something. And this is what began the whole thing with Feynman and his path integrals and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, I really uh, think that's an important uh, break uh, right there. Okay, so uh, now. You can use this immediately uh, to answer the question, how would 
somebody knew classical mechanics derive quantum mechanics, uh, and some parts of quantum mechanics. And this is non-relativistic, but you've got to realize that this sucker right here, the, uh, it's called the Poincaré invariant, and I'll tell you in just a minute, that thing is invariant to just about everything, and that includes relativistic transformations. This is a relativistic invariant. So, you know, we're talking about something really golden here that these guys are uh, playing with, okay? So, uh, having these guys uh, be integrable uh, means, first of all, that if I make a wave function using that thing as the phase, there's the phase, okay, and I really mean that if I use, the, I said h bar uh, uh, equal to 1, uh, but I'm actually not really doing that. I'm going ahead and putting it right here where it should be. I'll take an uh, in inverse of h bar and you'll get the actual way we write wave functions, uh, <clears throat> plane waves anyway. And so here we go and we look at the partial derivative of our of being p. Okay, so I, I take the partial derivative of this wave function right here, uh, just to play with it a little bit here, and so I end up with partial s with respect to r in that, in that uh, position right there. And um, I also have the actual uh, i over h bar factor coming down, and what that gives you is that this partial derivative with respect to r is i over h bar times p uh, multiplied by any of the wave functions, and You've all seen that, right? That's just showing the p operator is the minus h bar i or h over i partial with respect to r. Okay, so that's a very useful uh, connection. It's basically Fourier analysis, but uh, suppose you didn't know that. This is where you would, you could say you're getting it physically. P is h bar over i partial r. That represents uh, what it does. And then, let's try the t-derivative, that's the other side of the story here. The second hamilton jacobi equation, okay, I'm going to be doing a partial of it with respect to time, and I get uh, this. So, uh, basically what I'm saying is, what you've just created here is Schrodinger's equation of motion. That's the whole ball of wax in quantum mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But, if you play the game right, it's also relativistic quantum mechanics. This equation is true uh, relativistically. So here's classical mechanics deriving this subject that everyone thinks is very mysterious. It is. It just takes a little bit of the mystery out. Okay, so there's your shortening your time equation, which of course is occupying places up on the board here, which we'll I'll go over in more detail later on. Now, we've got a few more minutes here to play with something that's really quite um, I think important. And this is where uh, Feynman really understands what's going on with the minimum of the Lagrangian um, interval. Well, minimizing that is, is so important. Okay. So uh, here we're taking care of all the dimensions of space and then we're taking care of time uh, building uh, what is at least for the first equation uh, non-relativistic on uh, quantum mechanics. But um, here we ask why it is. How, how uh, does nature uh, enforce the minimality or maximality, depending on whether you put a minus sign on it or not, of this um, integral here. This, this is the thing with all the time going. But we, this is called the principal action. Uh, in um, books by Keller and, uh, that I showed you the, the uh, very first day of class. Um, this one is the reduced action, okay, Hamilton's reduced action, where he just makes it into a spatial interval. Either one of these uh, uses an argument like I'm showing here, and the idea is that the Huygens wavelets, okay, are producing the next wave. This is the contact transformation that's, that's going on a trillion, 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 trillion times as we sit here in your body, out in the space, you know, everything here. Everything we see and do involves waves at some level, particularly the quantum level, uh, generating the next wave. Okay? 
and it looks like a totally chaotic process because what happens, every dot on this particular wavefront is broadcasting a new wave, you see. So every moment this is, this is happening, you see. So uh, it looks like this wavefront is just making a mess out of the next wavefront. But that's not the case because you see only, only on what's called the true classical path does it, as opposed to some path that just goes randomly around the classical path, only on this path is there the extreme minimization of the uh, action. Only as a wave phase allowed to build up on that particular line right there. If it deviates slightly, that's a linear variation, so it's immediately canceled by another deviation nearby on either side, and then they're canceled too. Only when you're right on the extremum and you have a contact, you see, of that particular wave point right there that shows you're on the same path, does that path get to live? So the classical uh, um, result, a uh, classical trajectory, uh, results, at, at, um, well, as a winner of an incredible lottery. That's the result. Is you pick this, and each of these points a winner. Every other point that you would think would be uh, accessible by uh, the waves that came out of that point, but all the other points too, on the wave front, that's the winner. Now, Einstein uh, has a famous quote that the, the God, or whatever it was, of the universe does not play dice with the universe or the physics. This is clearly showing that not only is he playing dice, he's gambling full-time, 24 hours a day, drinking himself silly in the basement of the casino that is our universe. So Einstein completely misses the wave mechanics, basics, uh, for his whole life, it seems. Which is kind of tragic because he did so much else. But anyway, that is the thing that I really want you uh, to see here. The action is the quantum phase, and boy, that, uh, that's, that's important. And it's important for actual practical uh, things. What we're talking about here, uh, Feynman path sums, closure relations, uh, here's direct notation, here's the actual propagators that go in the exponents of the generators of the propagation, all of that kind of stuff really boils down to some pretty simple ideas uh, at the basics. They uh, need to be explored more, of course, but uh, we're, getting, we're getting a little better about uh, taking some of the mystery out of all of this stuff. So uh, the thing that I wanted to show you here was how do you actually do quantum mechanics if you only know classical mechanics. Well, that's being a little facetious because, I mean, you know classical mechanics of uh, it involves these things. Uh, what you do uh, is you numerically integrate Hamilton's equations, but you do it by color. Uh, you let all of the classical trajectories be colored according to a current cumul cumulated value of the action, but you adjust, um, you can adjust the energy uh, to the quantized pattern if it's a closed system. Uh, in other words, you can try a different, well, let's just say, what I do is I, uh, I represent the phase my colors. That is, the phase is just going around a phaser. Okay, so all of these things are fractions of pi. I say I start with red, and then at quarter pi, I sort of color it orange, and then uh, I get to pi over two, I'm yellow. I get to three quarters pi, I'm green. I get to pi, I'm cyan. Okay, and that's the opposite of red, so your eye sees it as so. See, there's something that's at uh, phase pi, uh, there's something that's very close uh, to, let's see, I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> th this one is pi, uh, 
the red, this one right here, is phase zero. So these, this is a wave function. That this one is zigging while that one is zagging. Okay? That, that, that's the way you read these, these, uh, these chromatic pictures where the colors are all coming on trajectories that have been running for some time to fill up the space, but they've been uh, changing their uh, uh, colors according to what the action, what the Lagrangian uh, has become uh, at that particular thing. Now, if you just use 32 colors, it's enough precision to, to do low quantum uh, stuff. Now, all of this is something that Michael Davis and Eric Heller, Rick Heller, uh, put together in 1981. This was a, a really big step. In being able to do um, molecular spectroscopy, uh, but in particular kind of, 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 of mechanics and physics that, that um, physical chemists and chemists, even wet chemists, started to use all of this stuff because it was so much easier to integrate a quantum mechanical system of some complexity uh, doing just this. Uh, later on, uh, of course, he did our thing. Now, this is our favorite thing to, uh, of the last few days. Uh, uh, maybe you're not so favorite because you, you've done this problem and maybe not done at all. But um, this is the, the um, fountain of um, parabolas and contacts. But here you see uh, th this is an open system with continuous energy. Uh, I, can, I, I don't have any boundaries where the the wave come back and reflect off itself. This is a two-dimensional oscillator in a box. So it's making uh, only a, a, a color red and cyan. This is a standing wave. The, the red is zero, so uh, that would be a, a, a up, 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 up. And this is down, 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 and down. So that's a very simple wave of a, of a two-dimensional a harmonic oscillator. Of course, we can solve that thing exactly, uh, but here it is being produced by something that doesn't know how to do that. So here, the energy is continuous. Okay. So you see it goes through the full chromatic, all the way from cyan to magenta to red, and then start over again with a yellow and green, cyan, a blue, magenta, and red. So. There's a continuous phase. These are all waves that you can actually see uh, interfering with each other. The waves that come up then reflect off the boundary and come down, interfere with the uh, ones that are, under, so to speak, underneath uh, there, that got there earlier. So here's what happens. And this is something you can see uh, from looking at the phase velocity. The phase velocity here, uh, the derivative of position with respect to time uh, in this uh, equation here. Uh, and the, the idea is that uh, d if you just look at phase uh, zero, dr dt is the ratio of this uh, to the p, okay, the coefficient of the differentials uh, ratio. And that's just the ratio of omega over k. That's a standard wave mechanical relation giving you what we call phase velocity. But when you put two or more waves together, uh, you produce uh, a phase still, but the, uh, uh, the envelope of this, the group velocity, is actually uh, what you're uh, interested in. Uh, here, we're talking about the derivative of uh, uh, omega with respect to k partial. That's h with respect to p. That's a slope of a dispersion function, basically. And this right here is Hamilton's first equation, and uh, the, the velocity being the gradient, the p gradient of the of the Hamiltonian. Okay. Anyway, this is what uh, you actually see, and we don't have an animation uh, of this particular uh, fountain that we've been working with as far as the colors uh, go. Or I could show you this wavefront. First of all, of course, it just expands, and then it reflects off the contact point, and it looks like a bat or a cat has two little ears, where the, the sort of singularities uh, of this um, of, of action uh, occur, and the, the ears scoot really fast, 
if, uh, uh, it's only a free fraction of time, I'll take B over here, and then they slow down. Try the link at the bottom, Professor Carter. Pardon? Try the link at the bottom. Okay, well, this one is, I had forgotten completely about that. Uh, I slipped me, it in behind you. Let me uh, get it. Um, it's actually probably right here. Let's see. What I'll do is I will go ahead on it this one. It is more of a hog. It needs to be safe. I know we push a lot of particles on some of those. Yeah, let, let's see. This is a, actually a faster computer, so let's see if it works. Yeah, there we go. That's kind of kind of showing. See the uh, the cat? <laughs> uh, it's shown with two uh, pieces to it. Let's go ahead and uh, erase the path and we'll re reset. I'll try two of those. Here. There we go. I'm going to pause this at a certain point here because I would like to make a point about this. What you n notice, first of all, the blast wave, which is showing you where classical things are, but then the uh, other side, the cat, um, what is uh, happening, I call this uh, uh, after Alice in Wonderland, Charles Dawson, Lewis Carroll uh, spoke of the uh, amazing cats that lived in, around uh, Grappen Hall, okay, had huge smiles. <laughs> And there were so many amazed people who made statues on the churches that show these things. But what, what's going on here uh, with this is the quantum phase velocity uh, can be really fast, but then it, it slows down. And we get out here, as I say, the cats all smile. There's uh, nothing left but a smile. And that was the whole point of the uh, Alice in Wonderland uh, fantasy. Uh, that there's a big smile up in a tree after the cat had gone and hidden behind it. The um, basic idea, of course, this is uh, the actual momentum of this is the gradient of the thing. That's part of the Hamilton-Jacobi uh, uh, equation. And um, this is, of course, not to be confused with the blast way, the actual classical thing. Um, <clears throat> The group velocity is the classical particle velocity. So the group velocity here is, is uh, going more and more. It comes up here, comes to zero, and then uh, starts growing, growing, growing. So you get a higher uh, group velocity further down because it's falling further. And that, that's this guy right here. That's just our circle. But inside this, the phase uh, is slowing down. And you can see the reason for that is that phase velocity is inverse in momentum. Okay, so you go higher momentum, your phase velocity slows down. The growth velocity, quite the opposite. Okay, well, in any case, that is all I'm going to give uh, today. We're just a few minutes over. I point out this uh, stuff as some of the resonance fine art that Rick Heller has produced. Uh, this goes back to some modes of discovered by Sophie Germain, who is a protege of um, the uh, terrible Napoleon. He was uh, very uh, erudite and um, a, a real gentleman uh, before he became very warlike and uh, disappointed everybody. But um, this is anyway something that we held in the exhibit, which I participated with my uh, humble uh, entries as well uh, at Fayetteville, Arkansas. And this is a R. I don't know how Alaska got in on this. <laughs> but um, the name of it was Approaching Chaos, Visions of the Corn Frontier was the name that uh, Rick uh, gave it. And these are just some of the of the uh, pictures that are uh, still traveling around. APS has taken this thing and allowed it to travel uh, all over the world. So um, I should point out that as soon as we got rid of our stuff in the um, museum, it closed, and it's it's now Symphony Hall for our, our campus. But uh, 
we did have a museum here. And shortly after this, a cartoon came out in the newspaper, and it showed two students walking by uh, the thing that um, was the building of a uh, uh, um, museum. And one of the students uh, said, uh, I didn't know we had a museum here. And the other student said, what's a museum? Okay, with that sour note, uh, we'll see you on uh, the next uh, lecture, which will begin complex variable. Uh, and we'll do that maybe in one lecture, but probably two. <laughs>